Good morning, everyone. Uh, from Berkeley, California, I'm Leif Nelson. This is the Data Colada Seminar Series. Uh, today, we have our special guest, Julia Minson, who's going to be presenting to us. And she's going to be joined by a series of great panelists. So we have Daniel Ames, Francis Chen, George Lowenstein, Jane Risen, and Juliana Schroeder. In addition, we'll also be joined by Yuri Simonson and Joe Simmons this morning. So I'm going to hand over the floor to Julia Minson in a moment. I just want to remind you, if you haven't been here before, that the Q&A function you'll find at the bottom of your uh, panel allows you to send questions or comments to all of the panelists, including Julia. Julia presumably will be too busy to casually read them, but don't worry, the other panelists will. And on top of that, even if we don't get to your question today, they are saved and Julia will have a chance to read them after the seminar is over. So thanks a lot for coming and uh, Julia, the floor is all yours. All right, can everybody see my PowerPoint? Awesome, yeah. thank you. Um, all right, thank you so much everyone. For uh, joining me today. Uh, thank you in particular to my uh, peers who have uh, generously agreed to help with this talk. Um, I also want to introduce Francis Chen from the University of British Columbia. Francis. Uh, Francis has been uh, a co author on this work for uh, longer than both of us care to remember, and she has generously offered to take all the questions today. So, uh, all the hard questions, just send them directly to Francis. Um, uh, so the work that I want to share with you all today uh, is motivated by a question that permeates a lot of my research program and I think is a question that's uh, really fundamental to the functioning of our society uh, and even sort of democracy as we know it, and that is the question of how people uh, who hold deeply opposing uh, views uh, and beliefs and even have sort of different understandings of what is real and what is false, how can those people engage with each other uh, and have meaningful conversations and interactions? Um, a fundamental assumption behind most of my work is that engagement with opposing views is important and beneficial. Um, so we have research from work on judgment decision making that basically shows that if you give heavy consideration to forecasts and judgments that are different from your own uh, accuracy tends to improve uh, we know that in organizational behavior giving consideration to minority perspectives improves loyalty and organizational commitment uh, and of course in cases of conflict when parties feel heard uh, that conflict is less likely to escalate that being said uh, people and organizations and entire nations uh, very regularly fail to garner the benefits of engagement with opposing views. Um, and so for the last few years, uh, I have been uh, trying to define, understand, and figure out uh, the way that we have defined receptiveness in our work is to ask, consider, and evaluate supporting and opposing views. In, in now, I'm going to be talking about receptiveness for an hour. So I think at this point, it's good to like linger on the definition a little bit and try to highlight some specific aspects of it. So first of all, notice that we're defining receptiveness in terms of the difference between how people treat information on their own side relative to how they treat information on the other side. In other words, we're not that interested in whether you're like a curious person or a deep thinker, right? There are uh, classic well-established constructs in the literature that capture those tendencies, right? So we have things like openness from the big five. We have things like need for cognition or need for cognition capture those types of tendencies. What we're interested in here is when there is disagreement, when there is discord, what is the gap between how you treat information that supports the other side versus how you treat information on your own side? The other piece of the definition that sort of 
very carefully considered is that we're thinking of receptiveness uh, as occurring at the entire spectrum of events that need to happen for a person to really process uh, some new information. So receptiveness is willingness to access, consider, and evaluate information, right, in a relatively impartial manner. We're saying relatively impartial because 100% unbiased is, you know, damn near impossible and probably not even sort of normatively appropriate. Uh, but we're looking at people who can shrink that gap at every stage of information processing. Um, and then the final thing I want to say about the definition is that notice that nowhere in here do we say anything about changing your mind or compromising with the other side, right? So we think of receptiveness as being about engagement and understanding, not necessarily as having anything to do with persuasion. Okay. Julia, can uh, I ask a question about uh, the definition here? Please. So when you, you, uh, you have it as a willingness, and so I didn't know if that meant I should think about it as a preference or a tendency or something, but uh, I wonder if you could speak to whether it has to do with ability in any way. So mm -hmm. if I am willing, is everybody able to do this? Mm -hmm. Or do I have to be both willing and able? Is there some sort of actual uh, quality that I need uh, to be able to do this in an impartial manner? Okay, that's a great question. Um, you know, so I have a little bit of my own data. I think it's more willingness than ability, uh, with the exception of, you know, maybe such extreme states of negative emotion where you just really are like unable to control yourself. Um, and in fact, in the emotion regulation literature, this is a question as well, right? Like to emotionally regulate effectively, uh, do you need to be taught to emotionally regulate or do you need to be convinced that that is a worthwhile uh, sort of endeavor? Um, and in our own work, one of the studies we did uh, to validate the construct is looking at mind wandering as a measure of consideration of opposing views. And uh, mind wandering uh, can be sort of divided in terms of intentional and unintentional mind wandering. And so what we found in those studies is that participants report intentionally mind wandering when they watch content they disagree with. And that difference in intentional mind wandering is what correlates with receptiveness, not unintentional mind wandering. So, you know, so that's, that's the data we have that kind of supports the idea that I think it's primarily about willingness. Um, okay, so. Oh, Julia, that, do you mind if I follow up with another question in there? Sure. Sure, do you sure. think that receptiveness doesn't apply to people that don't specifically choose a side, people who are either ambivalent, like they care about both sides, or they're indifferent, they don't care about either, this receptive does not apply to any of them? How do you think about that? So I think, you know, there's a difference between not caring and seeing the merits of both sides, right? So I would say, you know, seeing the merits of both sides, even though you can uh, is to some extent, you know, to me that sounds very receptive, saying I don't care either because it's not important to me or because I don't even sort of understand this issue we're talking about, that, that, that's a place where it doesn't apply, right? I, you, need, you need a perspective and you need an opposing perspective in order to be receptive to something. Um, so in the paper where we uh, sort of talked, where we talked about this construct and came up with this definition, so that paper um, came out in Management Science last year, and it's uh, myself, Francis, and Kathy Tinsley from Georgetown. Um, what we did is, is we offered sort of this definition in this conceptual analysis of what receptiveness is, and then we developed and validated a self-report scale. Uh, of the construct. So the scale is 18 items, uh, Likert scale, seven point items. Uh, and this is sort of like a smattering of items out of those 18 to just give you a sense of uh, the kinds of items we're talking about. Uh, and so then in the course of the validation process, what we did and did find is that people who report being higher on receptiveness by taking our scale, 
do expose themselves to more balanced information on both sides uh, of a political issue, um, are better able to maintain attention to counterattitudinal content. So this is the mind wandering study that I just mentioned. Um, and then are less biased in how they evaluate the quality of information when it supports versus opposes their views. We also did in that paper, so the last study in that paper, we uh, collected self-reported receptiveness from uh, a large sample of registered voters right before the 2016 election. And then we followed up with them uh, on the day of Donald Trump's inauguration. And so what we found is not surprisingly, people who opposed President Trump were less willing to you know, watch the inauguration. They uh, evaluated his speech more negatively if they did watch it. Um, but that tendency was moderated by their self-reported receptiveness back in early November. So essentially, uh, Trump opposers who reported being more receptive were actually more willing to watch the inauguration uh, had more positive evaluations of the content and also were more willing to consume different sources of news information about the inauguration than uh, people who reported being less receptive. So we have good evidence that, you know, the construct is there, it predicts individual level information processing, uh, and it also seems to predict behavior over time, uh, even outside of the lab. Julie, can I ask um, a question about that paper? Yes, please. In that paper, um, you do a factor analysis and you show that the scale breaks down into four dimensions. And in different studies, you look at the correlations between the dimensions. In some studies, they are higher. In some studies, they are lower. But to me, it really looked like um, there might be four different things going on. The four dimensions were negative emotions, intellectual curiosity, derogation of opponents, and taboo issues. And mm -hmm. I have, I have um, two questions. Um, one of them is, in the paper, you don't report the predictive um, ability of each of these dimensions. On when you when you start looking at the overall scale, you never you don't look at the separate dimensions. So the question is, is one of these dimensions doing most of the heavy lifting? And I'm particularly interested in because Dan Kahan has a paper on scientific curiosity where he claims that scientific if people who are high in scientific curiosity um, evaluate evidence in a very unbiased fashion. And curiosity is one of your four dimensions. So mm -hmm. I'm especially interested in whether that dimension might be doing the heavy lifting. Yeah, so actually, so great, great question. Uh, so the four subscales, I think, are a really important uh, component of the scale and can sort of be a talk onto themselves. Uh, in the supplemental materials of the management science paper, we have two tables that break down the results of each study uh, by subscale. Uh, either all simultaneously or each subscale controlling for each of the other three. Um, so we didn't put that in the manuscript because there's just giant, giant tables. Um, but to answer your specific question, the three, the three subscales that are negative emotion, curiosity, and derogation of opponents tend to be roughly equal in their predictive power. Um, and the one that tends to be a little bit weaker is the taboo issues one. Which was also uh, the one that, that correlated the lowest of the other three. Exactly, exactly. And part of the reason that we sort of decided to keep that one in the scale, so one, one version would have been to just drop it, right? Uh, mm -hmm. We decided to keep it in part because our population, right, that we're working with are Western liberal leaning sorts of folks. Uh, whereas the taboo issue one tends to correlate uh, a little bit with age and conservatism. Uh, and so we thought that in sort of future testing of the scale, if you're working with other cultures or other populations or people who are uh, older, we might see more action on that scale and it would be useful to sort of understand what's happening there. Um, but the first three scales uh, tend to work together uh, quite well. So curiosity. 
how do those three that. scales compare to the overall scale? Do the, does the overall scale um, predict much better than each of the three, which, are, which you say are about similar? Correct. Correct. Yeah, the overall scale does better than any of, than any subscale individually. Okay. So where I want to take us today, we have a measure. Uh, we have kind of evidence that it predicts individual level cognitive behavior. But one of the reasons that I have always been uh, really interested in receptiveness is the interpersonal nature of this construct, right? Uh, when we study these type of phenomena in the lab, we often present participants with sort of static stimuli in order to have good experimental control. But in reality, most of the time when you disagree with an opinion, that opinion is coming from some other human. Right, and quite often you actually have to interact with that human. Uh, and so one of the things that we've always been interested in is how does receptiveness unfold uh, over time and how does it affect uh, interpersonal interactions? What does it look like uh, when people are trying to be receptive uh, to opponents? Uh, and what does it do, right? Like, does it have actual effects? Uh, I always like to use this picture because if you look at it, right, if you look at the two Obamas, um, I have no idea what's going on in their heads, right? This is the day of the inauguration. Um, but if you look at President Obama, like if I were to make up what a person might look like if they're being receptive, I would think they would look something like that. Uh, whereas if you look at Michelle Obama, she does not look very receptive in this particular moment. So we don't know what's happening in their heads. And here we're talking about sort of their body language. Uh, in the paper that I want to show you uh, sort of detailed data from, uh, we look at the question of express receptiveness in terms of language. So uh, a construct that we're calling uh, conversational receptiveness. How do people express and perceive receptiveness as it comes out of their mouths or in this particular case as it comes out of their keyboards? Um, this is a paper that uh, just came out in OBHDP with uh, Mike Yeomans, Hannah Collins, who is a, a PhD student at HBS, Francis, uh, and Francesca Gino at HBS. Um, I'm going to show you three studies, and if we have time, there's going to be a bonus study. Um, in the first study, we are basically looking uh, Julia, at- Julia, before you get into those data, can you speak a little yeah. bit more about how you see the difference in acting receptive versus being truly receptive in terms of it. So in terms of an individual difference, like, you know, are there people that always act receptive, but they never say that they actually are and vice mm -hmm. versa? Yeah. So that's really the question that motivated this paper initially, or at least motivated study one. Um, we wanted to see, you know, like now that we can measure receptiveness in the head with our scale, right? Does it act? Actually come out in people's behavior. Uh, so to me, a really important question was, if I feel like I'm super receptive and I am arguing with somebody, can they tell that I'm being receptive, right? Do I get credit for it? Do things go better? Uh, or is it something that's sort of totally in my head, right, and not visible to the outside world? It really makes no difference as far as social interactions go. Um, and so that's where we started out uh, is trying to understand can people perceive receptiveness in others? Um, and then that became a challenging problem. Uh, and so in study two, we went to developing sort of a very precise measure of perceived receptiveness in text using natural language processing. Um, and then once we figured out how to do that in study three, we then went on to actually manipulate uh, receptiveness in conversation by uh, essentially assigning some people to a training condition. So Juliana, I'm kind of kicking that can down the road because that's what the rest of this talk is about. <laughs> um, any other questions before I go on? There's a question from Don Moore that uh, it's, um, do dispositional differences in receptiveness correlate with certainty or over-precision in judgment? Um, Don, I'm not quite sure what you mean by overprecision, but maybe maybe Julia knows what you might mean. Uh, I believe Don, we've had this conversation, um, and I don't have the data on it. Um, 
I would be very interested to know if they do. You know how hard it is to correlate much of anything with overprecision because everybody is so darn overprecise. Um, but I think that's a really interesting question. Thanks, Don. Anything else there in the questions? Yes, uh, not in the questions, but um, following up on Juliana's question, uh, maybe I missed it, but have you ever looked at the, it seemed to me that these two papers were about very, very different topics, even though they have the word receptiveness in them. Have you looked at um, the connection between somebody, somebody takes the receptiveness scale, your receptiveness scale, and then they talk to somebody, then they interact with somebody else. Does that, um, and then let's say you, you test it with the machine learning that you're gonna tell us about. Mm -hmm. um, do, are people who are measured as more receptive, do they um, communicate in a more receptive fashion? So I'm going to show you those data. Okay. Uh, the, the short answer is not much so, no. So the way people express receptiveness versus what they feel about themselves turns out to be very different things. Um, no, so I'm, not, I'm not talking no, about how they, I'm not talking about how they feel about themselves. I'm talking about how your scale measures them to be. Right, so how they report, what they self-report on the scale, how receptive they believe they're being uh, has very little to do with how receptively they come across to observers. So are you, are you saying that your scale measures people's self-perception of, of receptiveness or does it measure actual receptiveness? So what our scale measures is, I mean, obviously self-perception because that's how they're answering the scale, but also uh, their behavior in terms of how they process information, right? But the way they're perceived by counterparts, right, only comes across in terms of what they're saying. And so counterparts are perceiving receptiveness in a different way, right? So there's a big self-other difference in terms of what I think being receptive means and what my counterpart thinks being receptive means. But George, I don't think the rest of the audience has read both papers. So this conversation will make a lot more sense to people if I okay. actually show you the sure. data. From yeah, it almost too. feels like there's a step in the middle. So it's like how they re respond to the scale is their, their own receptiveness, how they then behave, like what are the, ver you could, code of their behaviors and then whether the other person picks up on those behaviors um so right. maybe there's something getting lost in that link to george's question i don't know okay okay so let's see let's see what more data will get us um okay so this is the study we start out with to try to understand how receptiveness is or is not perceived um, this is a study we ran uh, in, a, uh, in an executive education program that I teach in every year. Uh, this is a bunch of state and local government officials. They come for three weeks every summer. Um, different group comes for three weeks every summer. Um, and so on the first day of the program, before they have met each other, we give them the scale. So George, this is kind of what you're asking. We're asking them, how receptive are you uh, sort of dispositionally? Uh, and then we get them to report their attitudes on a bunch of controversial issues. On day two, we bring them to the lab and we pair them with somebody else from the group who they strongly disagree with on one of these controversial issues. They then have a five round back and forth chat about this controversial issue with this person they disagree with. They're in individual cubicles. They have no idea uh, who they're talking to. Um, and then we asked them uh, essentially three things. We asked them how receptive they thought they were being in the conversation. And we do that by using the scale, but we just modified to ask them about receptiveness in that conversation rather than in their life in general. Uh, and then we asked them how receptive they thought their partner was. Okay, so now we have a measure of self-perception and a measure of peer perception. Uh, and then we also asked them uh, a number of questions about how, how much do they want to interact with this person in the future? Um, so how much would you like them to be on a team with you? How much do you trust their professional judgment? Uh, and how much would you want them to represent your organization on an interagency task force? Remember, this is state and local government officials. 
Uh, these three items hang together pretty well. So uh, we mostly treat them as one measure of sort of interpersonal intentions in the future. And so first of all, what we see is that when people see you as receptive, when your partner perceives you as receptive, they think that's wonderful, right? So there's a really strong relationship between perceived receptiveness and wanting to be on the same team, uh, trusting your judgment, uh, and wanting you to represent them to a different organization. And remember, these are all people who were paired to disagree with each other. Uh, but the problem there, and that's the problem that you know you guys are starting to pick up on, is that there is actually an incredibly low correlation between my self-reported receptiveness, right, and how my partner perceives me, right? So this correlation is there. I can cluster the standard errors this way or that way. It's either you know barely significant or marginally significant. But the most interesting piece of it is how much variance there seems to be and how receptive I thought I was being and how receptive my partner interpreted me as being. And so then the question is, what are these partner evaluations based on, right? If I think it would be wonderful to have you on my team because I think you're receptive, like what does that actually mean? Um, and so this is when we got into the exercise of building a natural language processing algorithm in order to actually pick up on what is it people are reacting to when they say somebody else is being receptive. Um, for those of you who have never written a natural language processing algorithm before, uh, I, uh, I have like a really simple overview version of what we did. Um, so basically step one is we collected uh, a bunch of position statements on two very controversial issues. Uh, there was one uh, set of statements about police interactions with minority suspects, and then there was one uh, set of statements about campus sexual assault. We then got 1,100 people on MTurk and then matched them up with a position statement that they disagree with. Those 1,100 people had to write a response to the statement they disagreed with, okay? Then we got more people on MTurk, and we asked these people in step three to evaluate receptiveness of the people in step two. Importantly, the people in step three agree with the statement from step two, to which, from step one, excuse me, to which the person in step two was responding. So essentially the step three people are evaluating how receptive somebody they disagree with is. And so we got almost five raters per response. So we have a whole enormous boatload of people evaluating the receptiveness of these disagreeing statements in step two. And so then you train an algorithm that essentially picks out the features of language that make the step three people think that a particular piece of text in step two is receptive. And so when I say features of language, it could be uh, individual words, but quite often it is sort of phrases uh, that, uh, that, have partic that have a correlation with being rated as receptive in step two. Okay, so that's like the very, very high level uh, version of this. If you want all the details, uh, Mike Yeomans is the natural language processing genius behind the algorithm. Uh, and one of the joys of working with Mike is that he documents and posts everything he does. Um, so you can uh, go to his GitHub to download the algorithm or you can uh, install it uh, directly in R because it is now freely available to everybody. So before I start answering a lot of algorithm questions, I want to show you like an example of what this would feel like, okay? So here are, I'm going to show you two pieces of text from our data, okay? And the game is guess which text is more receptive. Um, for folks in the audience, put a one in the chat if you think the first piece of text is more receptive, put a two in the chat if you think the second piece of text is more receptive, okay? Uh, I will ask the panel to tell us if there's consensus. All right, so here's the first piece of text. 
Okay. Here's the second piece of text. Let's uh, play the game of which, which text is more receptive. Looks like people are getting it right, overwhelmingly. Overwhelmingly, okay. Overwhelmingly. <laughs> overwhelmingly, right. So uh, it is really, really clear that the first piece of text is more receptive. Uh, and in fact, it is. I totally, totally cherry picked these. Uh, the first one is one of our most receptive pieces of text. The second one is one of our least receptive pieces of text. The thing that's really hard is figuring out exactly why right? Like, what is it that makes it feel that way? And that's what the algorithm does. Um, so the algorithm gives us a crazy looking graph like this. Um, on the y axis are features of text, okay? On the x axis is the average count with which each of those features appears in receptive and unreceptive text, okay? So, Negation is things like no, can't, won't, don't. Uh, and you see that negation is more common in unreceptive text than receptive text. Uh, reasoning is one of my favorite ones because it's what academics do all the time. So reasoning is things like because, therefore, and actually. Uh, it makes you sound really smart, uh, but also probably kind of condescending. Uh, and so reasoning language is more common in text that is judged to be less receptive. Um, all these other things are uh, language features that are more common in receptive rather than unreceptive text. So this is why the blue bars are longer. Um, impersonal pronoun is it's, it's not very interesting, uh, but acknowledgement is really interesting and really sort of uh, interpretable, right? It's people saying, I see that you're saying, or I understand that, or you are saying, blah, blah, blah. Hedges is uh, moderating your claims. So it's saying things like sometimes something, something, occasionally, blah, 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 couldn't it be something or other. Um, the second person pronoun is you. Uh, demonstrating agreement is kind of self-explanatory, right? I agree that something or other. Uh, positive emotion words. Uh, and the first person single pronoun, so I. So now if we go back to our two pieces of text, these guys, these two pieces of text are different in these particular ways, okay? So these are the five features that differentiate those two particular pieces of text, and it looks like this. So I understand is acknowledgement, probably is a hedge, I can also see is acknowledgement, I agree is agreement, but possibly sometimes is a hedge. And then do not is a negation, therefore, uh, because, because are all uh, reasoning words and can't is another negation. Okay, so that's kind of how, uh, that's what the algorithm does. And of course, having that tool allows us to be sort of much more precise now about what it is we think people are reacting to when they say something is receptive. Uh, and it also allows us to be incredibly consistent in our coding of uh, sort of very large amounts of text um, in, in a pretty fast, in a pretty quick way. All right, algorithm questions. Dad, just send them to me. Um. <laughs> Julia, we have a question from Lishi, and I was trying to find the answer, exact answer in our paper, but you probably know it better that you can answer it faster than I can. How do you define receptiveness to participants when you ask them to rate dis disagreeing others' responses in step three? Okay, so remember we had, uh, okay, the, the short answer is we literally teach them about the construct and the scale. We say, there's this thing called receptiveness. Here is how psychologists define it. There's a measure of receptiveness. It has these questions in it. People who are more receptive answer it like this. So we try to eliminate as much noise as possible from uh, the way they answer that question, right? We want our participants to have the same understanding of receptiveness as we do. Um, and then we give them a quiz on the whole thing to make sure that uh, they got it. 
So it's sort of, it's our version of receptiveness. It's not like whatever they think receptiveness is. Okay, so now I think I'm going to uh, get closer to answering George's and Juliana's question. So we can go back to our state and local participants here. And remember these measures of interpersonal intentions, right? So now what we're going to try to do before we saw that uh, those measures of interpersonal intentions were highly correlated with how receptive people thought their partners were. Uh, now we want to see uh, what else those things are correlated with. Um, and so that's what uh, this graph is. So this bar is essentially just a bar graph representation of the scatter plots that I showed you earlier. So how receptive I thought my partner was is highly predictive of how much I want to work with them in the future. Um, this bar is the evaluation of the partner's receptiveness using only the algorithm, okay? And so you see uh, it's you know, a very significant predictor of people's willingness to work with the other person in the future. And notice that this is an algorithm that was trained on mTurk data using two issues. This is now state and local government officials talking about uh, one of the same topics, but also three other topics. So it translates quite well across uh, topics and populations. And then this uh, is sort of the interesting slash uh, puzzling result. Uh, this is participants' ratings of their own receptiveness on day one. So this is dispositional receptiveness. And this is their all, and the second one is uh, their ratings of their situational receptiveness in that particular conversation. So basically what we see is how receptive people think they are does not predict uh, their partner's willingness to interact with them in the future. What does predict it is sort of the actual words they're using. Um, and so then what the algorithm can do is actually help us understand the gap between those things to some extent. So this is, again, the algorithm trained on participants' perceptions of receptiveness, right? And so this is now uh, the data from the state and local uh, the main thing that I want you to notice is that the language, linguistic features on the y-axis are nearly identical uh, to the ones the algorithm picked up um, in the mTurk data. So this is what predicts partner evaluations of receptiveness. We can do that same exercise predicting people's own self-ratings of receptiveness. And so what that looks like is something very different, okay? The main kind of thematic difference here is that when people say that they were receptive, uh, what the algorithm picks up is that they were formal, okay? So people who thought they themselves were unreceptive use informal titles like, hey man or hey dude, okay? Um, they swear, okay? Uh, people who think they were being receptive use formal titles like sir or ma'am, okay? What they do get right is that uh, gratitude, right, expressions of gratitude, thank you for sharing that, uh, is credited as receptive both for the self and for other people. And the second person pronoun, you, is seen as receptive by both self and other. Julia, Julia? Yes. So the, what you're now referring to as self-rated um, receptiveness mm -hmm. is your scale, is that correct? Yes, it's their answers on the scale, correct. It feels to me like you're undermining the first part of your talk, like um, because all of a sudden, in the first part of your talk, you were referring to that scale as a receptiveness scale. Yes. And now you're saying it's self-perceived receptiveness, and it doesn't actually relate to how other people um, perceive you or, or anything like that. 
um, do you think so? Do you think that your scale that you report in the first paper isn't really about receptiveness? It's just people's perceptions of themselves. No, I don't think that. Um, and I think what you're pointing out is actually a really sort of important question and sort of a fundamental problem with how we study these type of phenomena. So something like receptiveness, there's a part of it that's a set of my beliefs about myself, right? There's sort of the self-report part. Then there is how do I actually interact with the information? Am I willing to listen to Fox News as a liberal? As a, am I willing to listen to CNN as a conservative, right? Am I willing to think carefully about arguments on the other side? Then, then there is what do I say to people when I'm faced with somebody who disagrees with me, right? These are sort of three aspects of this phenomenon that we have looked at carefully. There are other aspects that we haven't gone to yet, right? Sort of what happens to my long-term relationships or the types of conflict I have in my life when I'm receptive or not. Uh, and I think what's really important here is we're trying to study the construct from every angle, right? It's sort of that problem of, you know, people touching the elephant from different sides. We are trying to walk around the entire elephant. I think. And so the scale, the scale predicts individual level information processing, right? So people who say they're more receptive are more willing to go to listen to the Trump inaugural three months later. But when they talk, what they're saying is not what opponents want to hear when they're hoping to talk to a receptive person. So there's a self other difference. It's not clear that the speaker is wrong, right? It's just what we perceive as receptive in others is different than we, what we perceive as receptive in ourselves in terms of language. There's a disconnect. But the scale very cleanly predicts uh, individual de decision making in terms of how you process information. I think you don't do justice to your own scale. I think, <laughs> I think your scale is a pretty good measure of recept and that your second paper is mislabeled, that it, uh, it's mistitled. It should be titled conveying conversational receptiveness. And what your mm -hmm. second paper shows is that people, um, how people come across isn't how they actually are. Mm -hmm. um, I think I, I'm willing to accept that your first scale really does measure receptiveness, but your second paper shows that um, people don't convey um, the, how receptive they are. They're not, they're, um, so there's no relationship between how receptive you actually are and how receptive you come across. And in fact, you're, gonna, you're about to show us that it's really easy for people to be taught how to fake it. Right, so I really like your summary of the two papers. I do think the scale is really good. Uh, I think the scale uh, predicts the way people engage with opposing views better than any other scale we've tried uh, for this exercise. Um, and I do think that cognitive receptiveness and linguistic receptiveness are two different constructs. Uh, you know, so, and I think kind of articulating what the difference is and how can people who are cognitively receptive learn to sound linguistically receptive. Uh, you know, there's, there's an important theoretical problem understanding these are actually two different things. Uh, and then there's an important applied problem of figuring out how to get people to sound the way they want to sound, whatever that may be. But yes, I, I do love our scale. <laughs> so if, if these are really kind of separate constructs, the cognitive receptiveness and linguistic receptiveness, which I like having sort of different labels for them if they don't correlate very highly, then what do you think the linguistic receptiveness is really picking up on there? You know, what's the underlying cognition for the people that convey this type of receptiveness that your algorithm picks up on? I think linguistic receptiveness, right? So there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of things that we think that direct our behavior that we aren't very good at communicating, right? It seems that people who are observers, right? Who perceive, be, perceive language as being receptive, what they're focusing on is uh, engagement. Um, so asking, you know, showing that you've heard them, finding areas of agreement, 
uh, even things like saying you, right, which, for example, in, you know, therapy world is a no-no, right, but in this case, saying you usually means you said this and you seem to think that. Um, so it's, it's signs of engagement, but saying those words is different than engagement in your head, right, and that, and I think those two things don't sort of take away from each other. It's just important to recognize they're different. All right, I'm going to move on. Um, so here's what we got so far. So we've got this conversational receptiveness construct. Uh, and the great thing about it is now we kind of know what, it, what it's made up of, right? We have a lot of studies in our literature where we rely on participant perceptions of each other. But now we've gotten to sort of look under the hood and see what it is that people are perceiving. Um, and we know that people like other people who are conversationally receptive. Um, the quick study that is the bonus study, I'm not going to go into in detail, um, but the bonus study uh, was a data set that uh, contains Wikipedia data. So this is some data that was put together by computer scientists at Cornell, uh, where there are conversations among Wikipedia editors, some of which end in personal attacks and some of which turn out just fine. Uh, and so what we can do is we can use the algorithm on the first bit of text in those conversations and we can predict above chance which ones will end in a personal attack and which ones will not. Uh, and so what we I get from that is first of all, now the topics in the data set are completely all over the place. Uh, so we see that the algorithm translates well from topic to topic. But more importantly, kind of like the big theoretical insight is that receptiveness transmits over the course of a conversation. So you can look at how receptive people are being in the beginning and it uh, predicts the outcome at the end. Um, and so what we're trying to do right now is actually manipulate conversational receptiveness to see if we can get it uh, to transmit in a longer conversation. The final study that I want to show you guys is that so far I've been making like bold claims about how conversational receptiveness improves interpersonal outcomes, but all, all that data has been correlational, right? I haven't actually shown you any manipulated conversational receptiveness data. Uh, and so that's what I'm going to do in this final study. Um, we wanted to see two things. We wanted sort of clear evidence of causality, right? And then we wanted to see how hard would it be to actually get people to do this. Um, so we, again, recruited a, a bunch of people on MTurk and very much in line with the study that I showed you earlier where we developed the algorithm. We got all these people to write responses to prompts they disagreed with. We randomly assigned them to one of two conditions. In one condition, we trained them to be more receptive in terms of the language they use. Uh, and in one condition, we left them alone and told them to respond the way they would if they were having a conversation with this person. We then collected raters to evaluate the pieces of text that the writers produced. Uh, and the raters did two things. One. They, uh, again, gave us these responses about their willingness to interact with these folks in the future. And two, we were interested in persuasion because you could imagine that, especially since conversational receptiveness explicitly contains hedging, you could imagine that maybe, you know, people think that you're uncertain and they're not going to change your mi their minds, you know, because they sort of don't think you know what you're about. Um, and in fact, what we were interested in showing here that that's not the case. So what we predicted for the persuasion DV was an null result. Um, we then also asked the writers, so the writers who were randomly assigned, to actually predict what the raters would say about them, uh, because we wanted to see if people could sort of anticipate effects of receptiveness. Okay. Um, our receptiveness training was basically taking the features of the algorithm that were most predictive uh, and telling participants, you know, conversations sometimes go better if you do these things. Uh, and we told them the four things that we wanted them to do using positive affirming statements, 
acknowledging the other person's views, using hedges, uh, and trying to find points of agreement. And we said, imagine you have a disagreement with somebody who likes dogs while you like cats. Uh, and then we made them take a little quiz on how they would express conversational receptiveness in the context of that disagreement. Uh, the people in the control condition had to read an article about a new species of African fish and then take a quiz about fish. So we had like domestic pets in every condition. Um, so here is what we have. So these are the evaluations that the raters gave to the writers in terms of whether they want to be on a team with them, whether they uh, think they have good judgment and whether they would like to be represented by them in a professional context. Uh, you see that our you know, little like four minute receptiveness training increases that willingness to have future contact. And it turns out that the writers are aware of that, right? They get that. They're like, yep, if I talk this way, people who disagree with me would like me better. Um, our persuasion measure looks like this. So this is the raters. Uh, and we ask them, having read this thing, has your position changed closer to that of the writer or has your position changed further from that of the writer? And what we actually see is that people who were trained are substantially more persuasive than the people who spoke, uh, who wrote in their own sort of natural style. And this piece, our writers did not predict. To be fair, we also didn't predict it. Uh, but what we find is that uh, conversational receptiveness seems to make you uh, more persuasive. So, those are the data. Um, I do think it's worth kind of putting it all together because uh, as George and Juliana pointed out, there's a lot here. Um, I think what we're trying to do that's really important is we're trying to be very comprehensive in terms of how we study this construct, right? So we have a clear articulation of what we believe receptiveness is. We have a well-validated scale we know that it predicts uh, information processing both in the lab and in the field uh, and now we're starting to look at interpersonal implications and sort of the errors that people make in that space um, this is quite different than a lot of the work we have done in the past uh, in terms of partisan biases right where we normally sort of start with the bias and demonstrating it uh, we are really trying to look at the whole elephant um, Methodologically, uh, I, it, we have the opportunity now to study conflict uh, interpersonally, uh, and a lot of the people uh, on this panel, and I'm assuming a lot of the people in the audience are interested in this type of work and are uh, doing that themselves, right? Because we have big online panels, because we have the joy that is Zoom, uh, we can now put people together with opposing views and really see what's happening with them. And I think that's, that's exciting. Um, and where I would really like to go is also trying to look at how conflict unfolds over time, right? Sort of that additional dimension. Um, and I think that where this can hopefully take us is really good, robust intervention, which is what we don't have, right? We have a big literature on biases. We don't have a lot on how to fix them. Um, and so I know Juliana and Jane are working in the space, uh, but I would like to see more. And I think that uh, having a really good understanding of what's under the hood can help us uh, intervene much more effectively. Thank you to all the people uh, who've been uh, my co-authors uh, in this work. It's been uh, really a fantastic uh, set of papers to work on um, because my co-authors have been so fantastic. Um, and I have a few more minutes to talk. Julia, I have a, a question. And first, thanks for uh, walking us through this fascinating line of research. Uh, great presentation. And one of the things that pops out to me most is one of the final results you showed us that people appear in that final study with the intervention and the training to fail to appreciate the persuasive impact of receptiveness. I find that fascinating. And I guess I have a general question and a data question. General question is, do you think that could be because people feel like being receptive is 
uh, they have a folk theory, a widespread folk theory that being receptive is equivalent to being weak. It's, a, it's equivalent to capitulating. And the, that's a conceptual question about your intuition. And then the data question is, do you have dispositional, in that final study, I think it's study four in the paper, do you have dispositional receptiveness for those people? And if you do, do you know if people who are lowest in receptiveness are the most likely to underestimate the persuasive mm -hmm. impact of perceptiveness. That's really interesting. So the first, the, your first question, um, I, think that's, I think that's exactly right. Um, so George uh, and David Hagman, I believe, have a working paper with a similar result, right, where when people express uh, some uncertainty, they're actually more persuasive. So I sort of, you know, believe, I believe the persuasion result because now I think there's multiple data sets corroborating it. Um, and I do agree. I think people do see receptiveness as somehow, people conflate receptiveness with persuasion all the time, right? So when I give talks, I often get this question of, you know, why should I have to be receptive to those idiots, uh, right? And the answer is, of course, if both sides say that at least one of them has to be wrong. Uh, but the other answer is receptive doesn't mean you have to change your mind. And I think people confuse those two things pretty regularly. Um, we do not have dispositional receptionist data in study four, uh, but that's a great question. I, I now wish we did. So there are a few uh, remaining questions in the Q&A. Um, I'll try to give like one minute, I guess. I'll, I'll pick one. Um, Alex asked, um, I'm curious if you were to ask people to strategically show receptiveness, would they intuitively know to use these cues? It's a bit different from the misprediction data you've shown so far. My guess is that people would be able to mimic receptive language, at least to some extent, if incentivized to do so. I know you have some data on the, for the recipe, right, where you gave people different um, instructions. How did that I'm really turn glad out? you picked that question because I was wondering about the same thing. It just seems like there's so much you can do with the disconnect between your mm -hmm receptiveness scale and the linguistic receptiveness. It almost feels like a disingenuous type of receptiveness that people could be strategically receptive using the language, but over time, they're not gonna deeply take into account the different viewpoints. So I'd Yeah, love so that. there's two, uh, you know, two questions baked in there. The question from the chat is, if you tell people to be receptive, but don't tell them how to do it, they can't, they can't do it well. Uh, you can get sort of like a tiny boost. Uh, but they're not very good at it in part because they confuse in, like they confuse receptiveness with politeness, right? So the other person wants to be asked about their opinions and wants to be recognized. They don't want to be called ma'am, right? And that's, and that's kind of the issue. Uh, the deeper question of, uh, you know, are we teaching people to fake receptiveness? I'm okay with that. I'm totally okay with that because I think that most people go into conversations not wanting it to be a fight. And if we give them, you know, a set of tools to say, if you want to sound receptive, here's how you do it so you're successful, I'm comfortable with that. In fact, Jen Log and I have some data that shows that like a third of arguments start because the people had no idea it was going to turn into an argument. Um, Right now, one of the things we're doing is uh, working on new data where we want to see if training uh, one side in a conversation to be receptive, in you know, conversationally receptive, right? So essentially faking it, uh, will make the other side genuinely receptive, right? So can we get receptiveness to sort of turn into a positive spiral? Um, and so I think if, you know, if in the end we get cognitive receptiveness out of manipulating conversational receptiveness, I'm okay with the beginning of it being fake. Well, thanks, thanks for that, Julia. Thanks for the whole talk. Thanks for all of the, to all of the panelists for uh, being here today. Uh, great questions, great back and forth from everybody. Um, and just as a reminder, uh, all of the Q&A will get to Julia, and uh, provided that Julia allows us, we've been recording today's uh, presentation, and uh, we will make that available as well. So thanks, everybody, for coming, and we'll do this again next week. All right, take care.